Chosen Men, Military Skirmish Games in the Napoleonic Wars, by Mark Latham, part of the Osprey Blue Book series of war games, and today we're going to do a full 400-point battle. It should take a little bit longer. We have about 50 models on the table. Let's take a look at our Red Force and our Blue Force. Here is Force Red, led by... Oh, let me grab the right uh, channel here. Okay, here we have Force Red, led by Major Roran. That's the guy with the big sharp stick. He has a pistol saber. He is eager for battle. Whatever unit he is deployed with at the start of the game, which is going to have to be these guys back here, they get one free move before the game starts. He is a cavalry officer, and uh, there you go. He also has... Uh, what was the other... Oh, he's a cavalry officer, so these guys are going to be moving at 12 inches. In addition, we've got a a, a rifle, what would you call it? Uh, it's, it's infantry. Not line infantry, just straight up infantry. These guys are just armed with rifle and sword. They're light infantry, they're sharpshooters, so they have no range penalties. They can fire up to the rifle's maximum range. And when they move through uh, rough ground, there's a 50% chance they don't suffer the penalty. They have one heavy cannon, that's this guy here with three crew. Now, I did upgrade these crew to have muskets, so if they get charged, they're going to fight a little bit stronger. And then we've got a unit of five dragoons back here, armed with carbines, pistols, sabers. They have to pursue enemies that flee. They are very impetuous. They do have the same devastating charge that we saw in the last video. And as I said before, they are going to move. Their standard move is 12 inches. All of that brings us up to 400 points. It's a total of... Four units, or three, plus the independent officer who is likely going to start with uh, attached to these guys so they can buy that extra move. I don't know what scenario we're playing. We'll get there. Let's take a look at Force Blue first. Oh, look at these handsome lads. Now, the French are bringing a Lieutenant Colonel. That is Lieutenant Colonel Lenoc. Lenoc. And he has tactical redeployment before the start of the game. He is going to be able to deploy one, redeploy one unit. He's inspirational, so any unit within 12 inches of him will use his command, which is a rating of 4 instead of 3 for everybody else. He is bringing a unit of Hussars, and you will note the guy with his sword up high, uh, directly ahead, that is going to be the Maréchal de Logis. you got to tell me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. These other four guys are straight up Hussars. No, that's not true. This time around, we're bringing, let me bring him up here to the front and center. See how that guy's holding a little little horn in his hand? A little, little French horn? It's actually a bugler, but it's a horn and he's French. So technically, any horn he blows is a French horn, isn't it? That is going to allow them to re-roll their charge dice. When they charge into combat, they'll move the 10 inches plus 2d6, and if they don't like the result, they can re-roll because they spent the points on that bugler. Then we've got a light cannon. I should have pointed out the, the British cannon is heavy. This one is light. We'll see what that means once we start playing. And then we've got two units of infantry armed with muskets and bayonets. These cannon boys are not prepared for combat at all. They're just here to fire the big boom boom. With all that out of the way, we are ready to take a look at the scenarios and decide exactly which one we're going to play today. Here they are, all 50 handsome lads arrayed and ready to fight. But before they can, we need to find a scenario for them. The clever among you will have noticed we don't have any terrain out yet. I'm going to wait until I know which scenario we're playing. Conveniently enough, good old Mark Latham gives us six possible scenarios, and my D6 happens to have six sides on it. What a dink! So on a roll of four, we're going to play this scenario called... called... It's not your old man eyes. The Vanguard. All right, let's take a look at what the Vanguard means. We're going to set the battlefield up a little something like this. We'll roll off to determine which player will be the attacker and which the defender. Well, for that, we're going to need a red and a blue die, aren't we? Winner chooses. So the red gets to decide whether he's attacking or defending. Since he's got the big gun, he wants to defend. The defender starts placing scenery. Both players nominate how many units they're holding in reserve. The remainder are deployed one at a time, starting with the defender. Uh, looks like the defender is going to deploy here, and the attacker can deploy anywhere along these three edges. Remember that this game represents a slice of a much larger battle. 
which means these guys are seeing an objective that they think they can take, and they can come from anywhere they want. But we are using reserves and victory points, which means a couple of things. Victory points uh, are for blah, blah, blah. We're not going to worry about that just yet. Are we using objectives? Is that what I said? No, just reserves. So anybody you nominate for reserve, on turn two, they'll come on on a four up. On turn three, on a three up. On a turn four, on a four up. And they automatically come on on turn five. And our game length is going to be only six turns. For this scenario, terrain placement works in an alternating fashion. The defender gets to place the first piece of terrain. And in this case, our Team Red decided to drop a stone-walled field almost directly in the center of the board, but within their deployment zone. The blue team responded by dropping a couple of forests. We'll throw some trees out there in a little bit. And then Team Red said, okay, well, I'm going to open up this southern portion. And then Team Blue finished off with a house over there. I rolled D3 plus 3 for the number of terrain items and got 6. So this is... I don't want to shortchange this process on you. This deployment is critical because it shapes the general flow of the battle. Players take turns alternating the deployment of units. I've already done it. Defender goes first. He drops a cannon right here. He's got his whole southern flank ready to get blasted to smithereens. Team Blue responds by dropping their cannon here. They've got a clear field of fire to this half of the, call it the objective. Bear in mind, it's controlling the battlefield. It's killing more of the other guy's units that's going to drive the victory points of this game. Um, but the, the interesting aspect is the fact that they can only deploy from the middle part of that, that eastern board edge. So cannon drops, cannon drops. Redcoats fill up the field. And then they're done, the last unit that they have, which gives the blue team the option of withholding either their cavalry or one of the infantry units. And as you can see, they have withheld one of their infantry units. They've got one over here using this, these woods as a screen. Now bear in mind, they're a little bit vulnerable because the cavalry that could come on as early as turn two is going to come right there. They may be able to sweep around. The thinking here on the part of Team Blue is if they can get into the woods, they'll be safe. They don't have to worry about getting shot at until they get into the woods. Remember that in Chosen Men, you can shoot into woods, you just can't shoot through them. All right, so we are now ready to start the battle proper. So we're going to roll a D6, blue die, blue coats, red, cut, red die, red coats, and you add your highest STG score. STG stands for strategy, but I swear to God, the acronym STG, when I read it, I think of something else entirely. So red is going to get the initiative. They get to decide whether they, they want to go first or second. They want to go second. They want these guys coming at them. Rapid redeployment. D3 of your units, it's going to be one unit per the die roll, can move up to D6 inches before the action phase begins. So one unit can move four inches before the start of the game. That four inches is going to put them just shy of the edge of the woods. And as I move these guys up, I'll, I'll mention that uh, normally you can deploy within six inches of the table edge. Because I'm dealing with a table that is considerably less, not considerably less, as you can see, they're calling for three feet by three feet, and I've got about two and a half by two and a half. So I just tend to deploy everybody yeah, within three inches of the table edge. It just gives me a little bit more redeployment space. So now that the French have gone, it becomes the British turn, except, oh, they have a Cauldron of War strategy as well. They don't get to choose. They have to roll, and they roll one, which is, again, they get to redeploy anybody within three inches. Well, they can nominate units, and they can redeploy within, you know, so many inches. But I think we're going to... Ah, oh, boy, that's, that's a great question. Do we want to move these guys out and have them jump them? If they move fast, they may be able to wipe them out. Uh, these guys are tougher than those guys. These guys are actual light infantry. They're going to struggle to get through the woods. That might be a viable strategy, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to eat it and move on to the start of the game.
Team Red does have initiative. Their unit that they're going to nominate is the artillery unit. The first thing they're going to do is spin this gun around. Now, you can't move the gun and shoot it, but you can spin the gun and shoot it. And because this is a medium gun, it's going to have a range of 8 inches. That's the minimum range for, call it, solid shot. So you drop anybody standing on that point is going to take a D6 plus 2 damage. Then I have to nominate some artillery dice, some accuracy dice. A medium gun has an accuracy of four. I'm going to go ahead and just roll two dice. Now, for every point that I roll, maybe we'll do three just to make sure we get it out there. That looks like about ten inches to me. So we're going to, we're going to go ahead and shoot for the average. We're hoping not to get any ones. All right, we did not. We got a total of seven. So we measure seven inches, and that drops our graze die right there. And anybody between these line numbers is going to suffer D3 plus 1 casualties. Well, there wasn't anybody there, so unfortunately that shot fell a little bit short. If we had rolled another die, we probably could have hit him. But we risk rolling a 1, which results in a misfire. Hey, look at that. Longer shots are harder to make. What do you know? Very clever, Mark. Next thing we need to do is nominate one of these units, and let's go ahead and we're going to save him for last. The cannon's already fired this turn, so I think the smart thing to do is to bring these guys up. Uh, you know, they could have done their uh, tactical redeployment and deployed anywhere they wanted to. Ooh, uh, that's all right. I, they like where they were at. Uh, you know, they might have been able to deploy over here. Oh, that might have been pretty smart. If they deployed behind the house, they could then wheel around and hit these guys. It is what it is. Let's go ahead and bring them up as close as we can. Our leader is going to lead the charge, so to speak. We'll bring them up like so. Uh, bear in mind, they do have the overall commander is with them. And then we have the guys in red are going to get to go. They are going to do two things. They are going to dig in. And that gives them a plus one to their cover saves because they're taking defensive positions. Then they are going to hold their fire because they want to see what... They can make a reaction if they want to. The skirmish infantry can move three inches. However, because they're fighting through the woods, they didn't want to get shot at right away. We'll move these trees out of the way to show you. They're only going to be able to move three inches up to here. They are still in skirmish formation, I believe, but I'm not even going to look it up because it, it wouldn't make any sense at this point. They are still in skirmish order. To change formation to column of attack, they can do that. They've got enough attack points to do so. It seems a little odd that they're forming column of attack in the woods. I don't see any reason they can't. Now, it's going to take them a full turn to get out of those woods, make it a little bit harder to charge over here. But bear in mind, because they did that move order, these guys are able to use their hold order to open fire. And I'm very excited. It's the first time I've had to uh, to, to try shooting. Uh, recall that these guys are holding rifles. I know it's, it's, it's bayonets. They're, they're really rifles, and they have swords. The accuracy of those is going to be a 4 up within 12 inches, and remember that cover comes in with the save. So they get a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 hits. This may be enough to knock these guys out. Uh, also recall that they are sharpshooters, which means they get to reroll this 1, and with the 2 it's still a miss. That is a light cover, so they get a six-up save, and nobody saves. The blue guys are just infantrymen. They have a resilience of three. So I have to roll a four-up to save, and they get a total of two saves. Nope, three saves altogether. So that volley of fire wipes out two of these guys, and unfortunately, maybe they should have moved it to double. Unfortunately, that busts up their column of attack. You need to have a minimum of three guys in the front, and you need to have a minimum of three columns. You gotta have, excuse me, rows. And your rows have to be, have to at least equal the the columns that you've got there. So that's the end of the shooting. And I think that's the end of the turn. 
So we're going to roll a d6 for each side. On a four up, those reserves are coming on. No reserves this turn, which means it is blue guys' initiative. They can do whatevs. And I think what we can do is start with these guys. We want to lock up melee with this unit over here. There, well, or should we start? They, they're much more likely, uh, although they don't, they don't have visual on these guys yet, so they can't charge into contact just yet. Uh, they can, in fact, that was by design. They, this leader is hiding from that leader, so they can't shoot across. First thing we want to do is declare a charge action with this feller right here. And that means, now they are skirmish, so they're moving six inches. And then they're going to roll uh, plus another d6. Of course, they, they it's four inches just to get out of the woods there. Um, so this discharge may fail, but we'll give it a shot anyway. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. So they can move a total of seven inches, except that this first inch, this first inch and a half costs three. And then they are, oh, they're only three inches away. So they can make contact with this dug-in unit. And we're just going to bring them all on up, like so, to indicate that they're assaulting that wall. The yellow token indicates that this French unit has charged. This cannon is now going to fire at this cannon once again. And this time, we're going to drop our... 8-inch marker right there. We're going to go ahead and roll the three dice again to see what happens. And we got a one, which is a misfire. That means we have to roll... You must roll for each additional one roll after the first. All right, so we roll a three. Barrel fouled. The unit cannot perform fire actions this turn or the next while they clear the barrel. So what we're going to do is put two red markers on there. Well, now actually, we'll just put one. To remind us that on the next activation, they're still working to clear the jam. Then we're going to roll for this cannon is now going to take a shot. And they are, that is a light cannon. So they also have an 8-inch range. I think we forgot to shoot with them last turn. I don't know what they were doing. They were just goofing off. All right, and they're going to roll 2d6. They're going to get an additional six inches to their range, and that shot is going to fall short. They need to roll at least a nine to hit. That little gunnery duel is amounting to not a whole lot. I think it's probably historically accurate. Then we're going to bring our cavalry into position to charge on the next turn. Uh, we'll just bring them up here. I think that's close enough. Particularly given... Should we have them charge that cannon? That might even be the smart play, because if you wipe out that cannon, yeah, they're going to vault over that wall. Uh, and that's going to be their movement. And then we want to hit them with an impetuous charge on the next turn. So everybody's done moving. Now it's time to do melee, and that's this fight right here. We have completed our pile in. In this case, we've got seven blue coats going in contact with four red coats. They're going to get to make seven attacks. These guys, well, let's just let's just do these guys first since they charged. Goodbye charge marker. Melee of 3, melee of 3, they are going to be hitting on fours. They get a total of 1, 2, and 3 hits. Take each die, roll it again. Now you got to beat the resilience value. And because those are riflemen, they're going to have a resilience of three. So we got two successes. This was a four and a five. And that means that they have scored a point of damage. So we always knock out. So we knock out these two guys as casualties. Then, and they fill in, basically. Then we've got the guys in red, and we're going to put our casualties over here. So those two strikes give the French a score of two. I'll put them where you can actually see them. Then these guys, we've still got four, but now we're only going to roll five dice as a retaliatory strike. They are armed with swords. Forget the models, the representative. 
hitting on threes, they're going to score a total of four hits. No bonus to damage. Uh, same thing, resilience of three. So we're looking to roll three up to see if they survive, and they do a total of two wounds to these guys. So our combat now is at a score of two to two. Because the French scored, they go up to four. Because the British are in defensible terrain, they go up to four. Do we have a force commander within six inches of a friendly model? Yes, we do. That's an extra one, which means these guys have won the combat by a score of five to four. Every unit on the losing side, we just have the one, they have to make a command check. And a two is going to be a failure because that command check is modified by the difference in scores. They're actually at minus one. They're trying to roll a seven. So it's two minus one is a one. And then you add that to the sergeant's command score of three. They only got a four. Because they failed, they will now move directly away from the unit and they will flee 2d6 inches. They're going to flee 6 inches away. So this leader then goes, uh, I'm out of here. It says directly away, so I guess we should go in that direction. It's a little crowded here. In lieu of that, they have opted to run through the gate. And in fact, that's their deployment zone, so they should be headed that way anyway. They move six inches. I think they're supposed to flee. I think they're supposed to declare whether or not they're going to pursue before the dice are rolled. I didn't do that. So what we'll do is we'll on a one, two, three, they are going to pursue. They are. So they roll 2d6, and they get a total of six inches. They're not going to be able to catch these guys. Uh, if it's equal to or greater than... The distance, well, of course, the problem is that this linear obstacle is going to slow them down. I've, I've, moved, I've, I've advanced a little bit. No, these guys immediately flee, and then they say, yeah, we're going to pursue them. But now we move into the recovery phase. All of the units have gone, so we have to rally the broken units. Any unit that's broken must make a command check to see if it can rally. So we'll make that command check. If the command check is passed, the broken marker is removed, they may be activated as normal. Uh, moving fleeing units, a unit that flees, see this is what I don't understand, it says they immediately flee. So I move them kind of out of order, then we go to the recovery phase, they're no longer broken, so I don't think they're fleeing anymore. But these guys are in pursuit, so they can move their 6 inches, modified by 4 because, but they're actually going to make contact with this gun crew like so, which is, I think, a, a good result for them. That cannon's not going to be able to fire anymore. They're going to have to fight on. It's going to be four on six. But that's a subject for next turn. Here's our battlefield status. We're going to start by rolling for reserves. And remember, on a three-up, so both reserves come on. It is the Redcoats' turn. Remember, because their leader is eager for battle. No, he's a cavalry officer. They get in a basic move of D12 inches. When they declare a charge, they then get to roll 2D6 to see if they make contact. So he's going to charge this cavalry unit here. And they only get to move 14 inches. Is it a straight line distance? That would be 12 inches to here. And then... Two more inches to make contact. So he can just do it. He comes on just in the nick of time. And we'll bring these guys up. They're not in any kind of line or, or anything like that. We're just going to bring them on in like so. Then the blue guys get to go. Now they're already stuck in melee. They're already stuck in melee. So the only, thing, the only choices, options we have are to move the cannon or to bring on the reinforcements. The French opt to deploy here on the southern flank. Remember, they can deploy on any three, any of these three sides as they want. They're in the perfect opportunity to respond to these guys who are no longer broken, but no longer in flight. And they're gonna go ahead and they're gonna charge. Now they could deploy in line formation, take a shot, they could deploy in column, the problem with that is that when you're in line or column, you only move four inches plus the d6 for the charge. 
if they're in skirmish formation like this, they're going to be able to move six plus six. And uh, again, if they took the shot, that would be a difficult shot. They're nine inches, more than nine inches away. So they would only be hitting on sixes. Instead, let's go ahead and take the 50-50 chance that they can charge into melee. 12 inches means he's going to get stuck in, and these guys are going to roll on up. And not only that, but they receive the I have charged bonus. So we'll bring these boys in like so. And we'll give ourselves a charge reminder. We'll do some pile-ins here later. Over here on this flank, we're going to go ahead and move this artillery up four inches. You might as well. They're not doing any good. Everybody is locked into melee. But if things go poorly for your guys, you may be able to take a couple of grape shots that way. We're done. It's time for our pile-in moves. Almost forgot. These guys also charge. Let's go ahead and just do this from left to right. We are going to have a nice cavalry on cavalry action. And the guys that charge get to attack first. That means the redcoats are going to get the first stab at things. They are light dragoons with a melee of three fighting hussars with a melee of four. So they're only going to be hitting on fives. With their sabers means they're going to be hitting on fours. They will get because they have devastating charge, they are going to get an additional D3 strikes. So that's two. So in addition to the six strikes that they're making by dint of having six figures involved, they're going to get two bonus dice. And they are going to be hitting on uh, the Hussars have a melee of four versus a melee of three for the Dragoons. So the attacker is actually going to be rolling, the, I'm sorry, the, the Dragoons have a three versus a defender of four. They're going to be hitting on fours, but because they have sabers, they're hitting on threes. They get a total of two, four, six hits all together. And those six hits are going to be saved on, I think it's just the resilience, right? So the Hussars have a resilience of three, so they're looking to score fours to survive. Uh, only two of them survive. That means that's a total of four casualties. One, two, three, and... Hey, yo, hold up. I have made a terrible mistake. This whole battle, I forgot. Cavalry actually have two wounds. That's why they seem so fragile in this fight. That would have prolonged things considerably, but, you know, it's one of those errors that I made on both sides, so I'm not going to stress out about it too much. Just as you watch this battle moving forward, remember that whenever I take away one of these, two of these guys, I really should have only taken one. One, two, three, and, well, we want to save our, who do we want to save? Uh, we're going to save our leader and our, our big boy. They need to survive. So there's our four kills for the Redcoats. And then they're only going to get to roll two attacks in response. And because they have a... They, those Hussars are attacking with a four against defending the three. They're going to roll two attacks. They're hitting on threes. Uh, no, I'm sorry. They also have Sabres, so they're hitting on twos. They're going to get two hits in. And only one of those is going to save, so that's going to be one kill. Then you have to figure out who won. Well, obviously the Redcoats won. So the command there is four, but they're going to have a minus three to their check. Hang on. The total score is six to the red to three. No, to one to the blue, so it's minus five to the roll. They don't have any way they can do that. They're going to flee... And the Redcoats are absolutely going to pursue. Because they are cavalry, I think they flee 3d6 inches immediately. Cavalry free, flee 3d6 inches. They're going to go 10 inches directly away. And are they? the question then is, are they broken? On a 1, they are automatically broken. 
So the Fortunes of War, that is a big loss. That's going to score some victory points for the Redcoats, even though they're not doing so hot. The next thing we need to deal with is this fight here in the... Oh, I should use red for that. we got to deal with this fight over the cannon. They did not use their activation to clear the barrel. The boys in blue did not charge. They don't get any bonus attacks for any of that. But they do have a total of two, four, six attacks using... What are those guys armed with? Bayonets. So six attacks. Since they charge, they get to go first. And it's going to be a little tougher than usual because that crew and captain, they actually have... Uh, muskets. Oh, I guess that's all they have. All right, so th they're meleeing at two versus the infantrymen who are meleeing at three. So they're going to be hitting on threes. That's a total of five hits that the crew has to save. They have a resilience of three. All five are saved, so no casualties. And I think that's a tie. I think nothing happens. Wow, those are some tough cannoneers, ain't they? That means the cannon crew now gets to attack back. They only hit on fours. That's two hits, and the blue boys are going to save both of those. In the event of a tie, this will be the last combat of the turn. We've got a total of ten blue coats that are attacking. Uh, both sides have a melee of three, so they're going to be hitting on four up. They get a total of one, two, three, four hits. The red coats now have to save. They have a resilience of three. So they only save one of those, so they lose three models. One, two, and three. Which means only four of these guys are going to get to attack back. Uh, the good news is they have a sword, so they are going to be hitting on... Well, it's again, it's going to be three versus three. Hitting on fours. They're hitting on threes. Three attacks, and then a resilience of three is going to save two of those, so they only score one wound. Because these guys charge, so the, the result of the combat is three, four, five. Because they charge, they get plus two. So it's five for the blue... And then it is one for the red, which means the blue have won this combat. The red coats have to make a command check at minus four to the die roll. So three plus four minus four is three. They've failed. So once again, these guys are going to have to flee. Yeah, oh, no, I'm sorry. They have to. I, I did this wrong before. They have to make a command check now. Oh, no, they did that. They failed the command check, so now they flee. If they had passed that check, we could fight again. So they roll, oh, they got to roll 2d6 to see how far they run. It's going to be seven inches away directly, and they will be broken. There's our leader is going to run back to here. Oh, he's that's a casualty. He's going to run back to here. The good news is they fought close enough to the, uh, far enough away from their board edge, they didn't just run right off, but they are classed as broken now. We are done. So we have two units that we need to roll for, and I'll turn a little bit here so you can see where that other one is. Uh, these guys have to roll to see if they recover. The good news is they are, are they within six inches of their, their big boss? They're not. Uh, that's the guy who sh they need to be within six inches of. So they are on their own for this one. Normally they'd be able to use the, the uh, Major Domo's command of four. They need to roll a, what would it be? A command of three. They got to roll a four to recover. So they do. So they are no longer broken. And then we have a little bit of cleanup to do here yet. The first thing we need to do is check for these pursuits. The rules are a little unclear here because they say you flee as, immediately. By the rules as written, these guys wait to pursue. They, I guess they pursue immediately as well. As soon as they see how far these guys have gone, they have to decide whether they're going to pursue which has huge ramifications, because if they had fleed already, they wouldn't be anywhere near these guys. Be that as it may, we're going to go ahead and roll the 3d6 for their pursuit and to see what happens. Oops, sorry, guys. We'll call that a 5. They're going to move 9 inches up. 
And I think that means they're going to ride down this leader. No, they're going to be just an inch shy. They have to move here. That may be a bit of a problem for them, as we'll see in the next turn. And then we'll go ahead and roll for these guys to see if they recover. They have a command of, well, let's re-roll that, of three. They have command of four plus three is a seven, so they are no longer broken. Then these guys are going to pursue these guys, and on an eight up, they catch them. So on a nine, they catch these guys, and they wipe them out. But they have to move the full nine inches to there. So we'll move these guys out. That's going to be some victory points for the blue coats. And then we'll bring him up to where that nine inches was. And we're just about ready to start turn number four. We are ready for turn number four. And the blue guys are going to pivot and they're going to fire. This time, they are not going to fire the eight inches to see, well, should they? We're not going to pre-measure. We like to live dangerously here in the House of Wargaming. We're going to go ahead and just fire with the grape. Give them a little bit of canister, see how they like that. And maybe we can save our, our leader, Colonel Lenoloc. They are going to, let's see, roll a d6. If the die roll is a 1, it's a misfire. It is not. Instead, if it's a 1, this is a little odd. If that result is a 1, it's a misfire. If it's a six, you re-roll and you add that number to the six to find out how many hits it cost. Because we rolled a four, we have caused four hits against these Hussars. They have no saves, but they have a resilience of three. So we roll to wound, and they manage to stave off two of those. Oh, and I'm wrong about that. Resilience is useless. Uh, everybody goes down except for Colonel Lenoc. So that unit is now removed from play. And you have to treat this the same way you treat any other firing damage. Which means uh, after you get shot at, you have to take a command check. Remove your casualties. If the target loses 25% of its models, which they did, he's got to make a command check. He's got a command of four, which he fails. And if that's the case, he is now broken. So the cannon has fired. He's broken. Which I don't, I don't think he can do anything now. Broken units may not be activated. Then we are... These guys are locked in melee, so the only other thing we can do is charge in with these guys. They're going to pile in here. And with a five... Well, I'm sorry, it's, it's one D6. So with a 10, they're also going to barge in here. And I, I think we can all agree that this battle is over. Uh, it's the fourth turn, and you've got a total of 16 attacks against four cannoneers. You've got just a couple of horses and a cannon against this guy. I highly doubt he's going to be able to route all the rest of these French by his lonesome. So we're going to call this a... a uh, decisive victory? Let's take a look. I mean, we can count up the victory points. That's the way this is supposed to be done. The French have lost not a single unit. By the time this game is over, it's going to be all points to the French. And we can do a little bit of post-game analysis. The initial charge here causing those guys to flee. The defensive position was not nearly as defensive as the British needed it to be to hang on. And their flight over here put them in extreme risk of this unit that was able to come in and mop them up. This gun misfiring was huge, right? Like the gunnery duel should have been a wash, but as it was, that misfire really opened things up down here to the south. So, got to tell you, I'm kind of digging this game. You know, there was a there was a lot more motion than last time, a lot more tactical decisions to make in the long run. As with any battle of the era, deployment is critical. 
And the deployment at the start of the game really drives the action in the middle. You do have some limited ability to redeploy your boys through the course of the game. But your opponent has a say, and that decision to redeploy puts the initiative onto the other guy. He's going to be able to react as you do that. A lot of interesting tactical choices. As much as I enjoy the smaller tactical games such as Song of Blades and Heroes, once you get beyond about 10 to 12 figures on a side, it really starts to get cumbersome. This game feels cumbersome. We only played through three to four turns in about 90 minutes. Of course, it'll be edited down to less than 90 minutes. However, uh, the greater point here is that the game can handle battles that size in that short amount of time. And I'm, I'm really kind of digging what we're doing here. That 90 minutes also includes quite a bit of shuffling through the, the, the rule book. As we grow more comfortable, we're going to be a lot more efficient, and we're going to be able to put something special together. I don't want to over-promise and under-deliver, but once I get a, a, a unit of foot dragoons painted up for the blue coats and a couple of more kind of line infantry style for the red coats, uh, I do have some more uh, fancy lads. You know, we're looking at uh, guys you, you haven't seen the bannermen yet. Once those come in, the standards come in, that'll offer, and drummers come in, that'll offer some more tactical choices, just little special abilities that add some new wrinkles and give us something else to track. And hopefully we'll be able to put together a rather interesting map-based campaign. Like I said, don't want to over-promise on to deliver, but t keep an eye out for that here on the channel as we explore everything that this wonderful hobby has to offer. And after all, that's why we call it the joy of wargaming. I'm praying for you.